thank you all for getting up at this unholy hour and coming to listen to me. Um, yeah, my name is David Wolliver. If, if you guys use Twitter, I'm at Wolliver on Twitter and tweet quite a bit there. Um, so before I get into telling you about the important parts of school from, uh, from my perspective, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. So uh, I studied software engineering at U of T from 2006 until 2009. Um, in 2009, I was recruited by one of my professors to go work for a startup called Masuni. I was the first employee there, and we were building furniture mass customization. Basically, uh, you would use my software to click and drag around online, and in about five minutes, you were able to customize the size, shape, color, and style of, uh, of your cabinet or piece of furniture. My code would then generate all the instructions for these big like floor size CNC mills that would cut it all out, and that was kind of cool because if I got bugs and made parts too small, wood would go flying around the shop floor. And at the end of the day, we got to make these really cool, nice pieces of uh, wooden cabinetry for about the same price as it would cost to mass produce them. After that, I went on to a company called Luminotics that was started by some of my close friends from university. We built these little LED tiles like this that you could you could stick them all together to put cat videos or big 14 by 48 foot video displays that would show ads and do that sort of thing. And then uh, with Luminotics, I built all the software from the front end web application that let people uh, upload their upload their videos and images, schedule that content uh, to the software that actually ran on the sign, put them up. And let me tell you, it's super super cool to have root on one of those. <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Akindi. How many of you have done Scantron bubble sheets before? Oh yeah, so you know just how terrible those are. Well, we're trying to make that just a little bit less terrible. And while all that was going on, I, I also, with a, along with a couple of my good friends, started PyCon Canada, Canada's first national Python conference and then went on to become a core organizer of PyCon North America, the kind of big uh, grown up Python conference. It's actually, just as a, as a pure aside, going to be here in April, the three or four blocks down the street. And it's a fantastic conference. We have great student rates, like 150 bucks. So if you're free in April, you should absolutely come. It's going to be a blast. Um, I also organize a Python meetup in Toronto and a really cool meetup called XVZ app. Basically, it started uh, because a friend and I were kind of bored with the meetups that we were going to and doing. Uh, so we made this night where we get tech workers from the city to come and tell true personal stories from their lives. Come ask me about that later. I'd love to talk about it. But what does all this have to do with the value of school? Well, all of the things that I just described, and, and quite frankly, most of the other cool things that have happened in my life since about 2009, have come from a, a direct, directly because of the people who I met and the friends that I made while I was at school. And I ultimately decided to leave school because I felt that I had so many opportunities and just there were so many doors that were being opened uh, through, through my network, through, my people, through the people that I know, that it really just didn't make any sense for me to stay. Now, the one like big asterisk caveat that I want to put on there, I'm not necessarily telling you to do the same thing. One of the major reasons is that, uh, I don't know if you've heard, there's a, like a little place called the valley that some kind of ridiculous things are happening in, and it can be really hard to move there if you don't have your degree. Um, so consider that before you make the same decision. But I really can't, uh, yeah. Now, one of the things you might be thinking right now is, well, that's great for you, Dave, but not really my dad. I'm not really the kind of person who likes to get out there to do that sort of thing. Um, and before you dwell on that too much, let me tell you a little bit about my story. So, the person that I was in high school is pretty much unrecognizable from the person that I've become today. You know, when I, when I talk to my mom and I tell her that I'm super excited to be able to speak at this conference, which by the way, this is actually, in telling on this, uh, the first time I've spoken to anyone this size for more than five minutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm possibly syndrome, right? Uh, and, and I tell her that I'm organizing meetups. She actually can't believe it. Like, she's, she's in awe. Well, not in awe. You know what I mean? 
So in, in high school, sociality was difficult for me. Um, you know, I, I kind of make fun of people who talk about the weather. I only had a small social group, and the thought of meeting and, and getting to know new people made me kind of anxious. Um, but probably like a lot of you, I kind of like computers. Programming was pretty fun. And you know, the thing, the thing that I really love, and I still love, and this is what this is what really gets me going about computers and programming is the fact that you can take these massively complex systems, these systems that are so ridiculously complex, no one person could hope to hold it all in their head and understand how it works. But you can start, I can start diving into them and I can, un I can start understanding the rules. I can uh, start thinking of the patterns, memorizing the crazy minutia that happened because someone in 1980 made some decision. And I can start making sense of that. And I can start to learn and then I can start to unlock all that incredible potential to build cool stuff and make awesome, awesome things. <coughs> so anyway, uh, in high school, one day, totally, totally by chance, I happened to pick up this book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> uh, some of you have heard about it here. And what it, what it helped me to realize was that I can see sociality, in, and now forgive me if this is just a little bit crass, but it, it works for me. I can see sociality in the same way that I see computers and programming as this massively complex system with all sorts of crazy rules and patterns and minutiae. And for me, that was this incredibly liberating realization because, you know, I'm pretty good at learning rules and I'm not bad at pattern matching and minutiae, oh, bring it on. And so all of a sudden, sociality wasn't so intimidating to me. Um, it's just another problem to solve, another set of rules to learn. And it turned out at some point I really started to enjoy it. So I would love to talk, to talk for hours about this, but they've only given me 20 minutes now, so I'm going to have to cut to the chase, and there's going to be two of these quick little patterns that I want to show you that I learned that help me enjoy sociality a bit more. And hopefully I can whet your appetite to start learning, uh, for you to start learning more yourself. And you know, if you see me around, please, I'd love for you to come say hi and start talking to me, and I can talk for hours. So the first pattern is having some good answers to common questions pre-baked in. You know, when, in just about any context, if somebody comes up to start a conversation with you, you can probably guess which of the three or four questions they're going to ask or which of the things they're going to say. And I found that having pre-rehearsed answers uh, I found that having pre-rehearsed answers to these questions made meeting new people and going into these social situations a whole lot less stressful. Because all of a sudden, I don't need to be worried about what am I going to say when they ask me like, where I'm from, or is that going to be a good answer if I tell them that I'm in computer science? Instead, I can, I can just kind of regurgitate whatever I practice, and then get on to the things that were more interesting to me, like listening to what they had to say, or finding and finding conversation that was fun. So, what makes a good answer to a question? There's a whole lot, there's a whole lot you can do there, but a couple of the quick little ones. Um, first, the first and most important thing though is realizing, at least for me, that when somebody asks me a question like, hey, where are you from, or how was your trip here, and is that weather crazy, they really don't care. Like, that's not important. What, yeah. Um, what's really going on there under the hood, the pattern that's, the pattern that's going on is that person is trying to find something interesting to talk about with me so that we can get to something that they actually do care about, whether that's maybe movies or games or programming or who knows what that is. Um, but it's a whole lot easier to start with a question about the weather because that can lead into things. So one, uh, one great way that I pre-rehearse, or one great thing that I do in my pre-rehearsed answers is I figure out how I can stick in some extra information. So for instance, um, if I was to ask my buddy Andrew, hey Andrew, where are you from? And he was to say, Toronto. <coughs> There's not really a whole lot I can follow up with. Say about that part tomorrow, you've got that big pointy thing, right? <laughs> but if he was to say something like, oh, well, so I'm, I'm, I came here from Toronto, but I, I was born in Scarborough and I spent my early kind of childhood driving around the States with my family. Now all of a sudden, that's an interesting answer, and there's like 17 things I can go and I can start asking about, and, and starting to find something interesting. Um, having a story is fun too, even if it's just a little one. For instance, if, if somebody asks me, how, how did I get here? 
So we all met. Well, so I took the train, but I was kind of an idiot because the train left at 9.25, and I left my door at 9 o'clock, and I had Jenny phoning me like 20 minutes later saying, hey, where are you? The train's about to leave. Um, or something interesting. So for instance, if somebody asks you what you're studying, chances are you've done some courses that are computer science, because like, let's face it, if you're studying computer science here, that's not super interesting. But if you've done maybe some, I mean, <laughs> maybe you've done some cool bioinformatics, or you've studied uh, African studies, or you've done something like that. Well, that's really cool, so you can start talking about that. Um, and obviously, making sure you finish that answer leading into another question, even a simple like, oh, what about you? Or better yet, if you have a really cool answer to a question, like maybe you come from a really interesting place that you'd love to talk about, following up that, like, oh yeah, I came from Toronto, well, what about you, where, where were you from? And that's all of a sudden you're set. Now, the second quick little pattern that I want to talk about is starting a conversation. And this is a thing that I know probably for many of you, you're getting anxious just thinking about, but I found that when I just like literally learn the rules and regurgitate words, it can become really easy and a whole lot less stressful for me. So obviously you've got, uh, you can just ask one of the common questions, one of the things that I had on the previous slide. You know, if you're at a friend's party, you can ask, hey, how do you know common friend? Um, another one that I love is, is if you're in a super awkward, like you've probably been with your parents or something to one of their stuffy work events, and you're like the only person under 50 standing in the corner. And you see like the one other person going up to them, like, oh man, this is so awkward, like what's the deal with that? Huh. But my favorite is, uh, is noticing or complimenting something about the other person. So uh, maybe an interesting t-shirt, laptop sticker, or a piece of jewelry. Now the one like caveat here is it should be something the person has control over, like saying, hey, you got a really nice nose. <laughs> 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 Uh, there's, there's actually a really great talk by uh, Michelle Levesque from TeamSec 2013. <coughs> Five hacks for hacker brains. You can find that if you just Google those words. And in the first 15 minutes, she, she talks about this. She talks about some of the great stuff too, but uh, the part that I'm talking about is the first 15 minutes. So now I want you guys to try. So if you turn to the row behind you, where somebody you don't know is sitting, I want you to give them some <laughs> Biking, whatever that is, 
the more you talk about that, the more you'll become known as like the person for X. And all of a sudden what you'll find is people will also start coming to you if they have that interest. And if there's no feeling, at least for me, cooler than when I'm like sitting around and somebody walks up to me like, hey, you're Dave, you're like, you're like Python, don't you? Like, you wanna talk about Python? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so now let, let's let's get practical for a minute. These are all great things to talk about in theory. Um, but you're in school, you're, you're in your undergrad, and there's three awesome, incredible like things that I guarantee will change your life if you do them. So the first, and in my opinion, the most important, are clubs. Like I, I actually cannot say enough good things about joining clubs in your university. Uh, this may actually be the last time in your life that you are given the opportunity to build a solar car, uh, write for a newspaper, or maybe have to organize a massive games night with your CS club. Double super extra bonus points if you join clubs with non-computer science people because there are more than computer science people in the world. And let me tell you, they are pretty cool too. They don't fight. Um, another incredible thing you can do with clubs is become leadership. Um, student organizations always need people in leadership and administrative roles. And the super cool thing about that is you get to hang out with the other leaders. And those are probably going to be people who are doing other interesting stuff. And that will open new doors and unlock even more possibilities that you just never considered. Um, one, of, one of the best things that happened to me in, in university was when my good buddy Ken, who's over at the Yelp booth, so you can go say hi to Yelp and Ken, uh, when he one day asked me, like, hey Dave, uh, do, you want to be, do you want to be on the computer science student team and help us organize? Uh, and that got me into all sorts of incredible positions, like driving rich installment around Toronto. Um, just a few suggestions. You're, you're, if you're at Waterloo, there's a CS club, which is pretty cool. At U of T, there's a CSSU. I'm sure your university has something similar. Um, the student newspaper is awesome. Uh, improv is also kind of fun, and it helps you get to, you know, better at talking, better at improvising. Um, but really, whatever that is that you're into, swimming, photography, social justice, uh, solar cars, or Formula SAE. And the other big thing there is inviting your friends out. Because it's so A, it kind of like, Kind of sucks to go somewhere and like you're the only person you know when you're sitting in the corner trying to make conversation while the club is all like doing their thing because they all know all each other for the last five years. But you can also be that person who invites your friends into that, who your friends will remember forever because you are the one who said, "Oh yeah, you should come and do this thing with me." <coughs> the second is meetups. Um, Meetup.com just like go there, put in whatever words you're interested in, especially for tech stuff. I guarantee that unless you live absolutely in the middle of nowhere, and if this is the case, I'd really be interested to hear if you can't find tech meetups in your area for stuff you're interested in. Um, and the second thing that you should do, so you should go to attend one, see what it's like, and then at the second meetup, you should speak. And you have absolutely no excuse to not give a lightning talk. A lightning talk is a five minute talk on whatever is interesting. And I love giving lightning talks. Because literally my formula for lightning talks is, what have I done in the last week? Find one interesting thing in that, find three things to say about that, and I have a five minute talk. It's also great because if your talk is boring, what's going to happen is everyone's going to start pulling out their phones, checking Twitter, and by the time they're at the top of their timeline, you're going to be at the thank you, do you have any questions phase, and all they're going to remember about you is you were that cool person who gave a talk. <laughs> um, he, I should also plug, QSEC is going to have lightning talks, and I expect if I, if I don't get like 15 people at least signing up for that, I'm going to be pretty disappointed. Uh, and finally, going to conferences. I'm not I'm kind of like preaching to the choir just a little bit here. Uh, but a few, just a few little tips that I think about, picked up about conferences in my time. Uh, the hallway track is by far the best track. Quite honestly, when I go to a conference, I might go to like two of the talks. Uh, usually, I just be out in the hall, chatting with people, meeting with people, because that's where the most that's where the most interesting things are going to happen. Uh, that's where you're going to end up arguing about how great templating is uh, with the author of your favorite templating language, and then he goes on to tell you about how he writes code without uh, without typing. He uses his voice entirely. Um, one of the tricks that I found too is, is the first time I went to PyCon, it was pretty intimidating. There's I don't know anyone there. Uh, this was back in like 2008. So I had my Sony Ericsson W810i feature phone that had a web browser that could both render HTML and images. 
So I loaded it up with pictures and names and little short bios of like the five or 10 people I wanted to meet so that I could just kind of go through that. And when I would notice one of those people, I had a kind of pre a conversation that I had already worked through in my head. So I could just go up to them and like, oh, hey, you're Jenny. Oh, yeah, so you work on that really cool Drupal thing, right? And I don't, like, I don't need to think about that, and then it's great. Um, Again, <coughs> volunteer and become leaders of conferences always need volunteers. Also, a few seconds, you're going to have a volunteer input session. Pay attention to that. Um, and I'm going to be tweeting after this talk a big list of conferences that might be good this year, uh, especially conferences in Canada. So, that's, uh, that's what I have to say. That's what I have to say. the wisdom that I'm trying to impart and the, the most valuable things that I got out of university. So hopefully you can learn from my, from my mistakes and my not mistakes. Does anyone have any questions? We have two minutes for questions. We have two questions. Okay. We have two questions. Okay, any one more question? Yeah. Um, I don't mean it to be critical, but you had one year left for school. Who knows what would happen in 10, 20 years oh. on the line? So how did you make the, come up with the decision of dropping out? Oh, uh, well, I was 19 and stupid. Uh, no. <laughs> um, the, so I made the decision primarily looking at what uh, so first school, for me, the academic, specifically life, wasn't one that really, that I wasn't super about. Like I, uh, I'm a, I much prefer practical stuff where I found in my, in my kind of education, it was very academic. They were spending a lot of time learning theory and not a lot of time writing code. Uh, so for me, the opportunity to just go and be the only technical employee at a startup where I'm literally like learning the programming language while I'm building this massive like 100,000 line application was, I believe, for me, the better, more interesting experience. 10 years from now, who knows? Uh, but that's, that was the arithmetic that was going on in my head. No problem, thank you. Hey. So I found the concept of dropping out really interesting. <laughs> um, okay, I want you to imagine this, OK? Uh, we're 20 years down the line. Okay, 20 years. Uh, there's, your, your children are just off their, their, uh, their university age, right? Do you tell them to go to university or not? And they're really smart, remember, and they have technical stuff. That, that will depend where the world is in 20 years. Um, one, of the things, one, of the, one of the things that really frustrates me with education right now is you kind of have the choice. You can go to uh, university and get the super academic, or you can go to college and have all your friends think, like, why aren't you going to college? But actually getting the super practical uh, education that you're going to be able to go and use and do some real interesting stuff with. And I, like, I wish somebody in high school would be like, hey, dude, like, college is a good thing. You can go, and, and I think I would have enjoyed that a whole lot more than university. Um, so it will really depend on what the landscape is. And I'm not, I think for, for a lot of people, uh, university is great. Like, the, academic, the, the more academic education is wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. So you suggest your kids to go at least to one institution, it could be college or university. I think educa education is fantastically important. Um, and if what I had done was drop out to go do some repetitive job where I'm not learning anything new, where I'm just kind of a code monkey writing the same JavaScript day in and day out, that would like that would have been a terrible decision. But since what I was doing was going into this field where I like I have never built a hundred thousand line application before, <laughs> let alone figured it out on my own. Uh, that I, like, I was getting that education, and I was putting myself. I was making sure that I had the mentors in place and the people in my life who were who were pushing me forward and, and kind of guiding me. Thank you. No problem. Heather, so I've also read um, *Everyone Friends* by Dale Carnegie. Yep. Do you have any other books that are sort of similar that you could suggest, or other authors? You know, that's that's a wonderful question. Uh, I don't have specific authors. What I found really interesting is going through. Usually, like what comes across online, you get the kind of pop psychology stuff. Um, piecing to that, finding the interesting tidbits. Like there was one uh, just the other day, actually, it was the 36 questions to fall in love. Uh, you see that article. Basically, what the, it was an experiment proposing that if you get uh, two people and they ask each other these 36 questions, they will most likely fall in love. And, and so that's the sort of thing that I love, and I love reading through and thinking about how I can take that and apply that to my my life and my relationships and interactions. So, so watch out. <laughs> uh, so you said there's a, um, some benefits to going to school, such as um, networking and all that kind of stuff. And you also said there's a lot of downsides, like the kind of the way they academicize it. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who want the benefits but want to avoid kind of the downsides. 
Uh, that entirely depends on how much self-control you have. Um, can you sit down at Khan Academy and teach yourself things? I can't. Um, I need to. I mean, I mean, for people who are already like enrolled in university oh. and want to stay there. You know, oh, like, oh, sorry. Who want to stay? Who are enrolled and want to stay? Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think so. Uh, finding that balance, making sure that you're getting out there, you're being part of clubs, you're, you're uh, it, it's building applications on the side, you're doing like. Basically, you're taking advantage of the fact that this is likely one of the last times in your life you're going to have big swaths of freedom, which um, I realize not everyone will, but many of you can probably skip class a little bit and get that 70% instead of the 90%. Uh, taking that time and doing something more interesting, like whether that's joining a club that is entirely uncomputer related or uh, getting together with a couple of your friends and building a Twitter clone, because by doing that, you're going to get some much better experience than what you're doing in class. So, thank you. No problem. All right. Well, thank you very much, guys. I look forward to uh, seeing you back.